Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to the second event of our webinar series, Unlocking the Power of Clean Energy Innovation with Living Labs. My name is Tanya Suni. I lead the impact and exploitation activities in the Clean Energy Transition Partnership. In this partnership, we aim to support our projects and the knowledge community to gain all the necessary skills and networks to seamlessly integrate their innovation into society, making a tangible impact and driving the widespread adoption of clean energy solutions in the market. In the first webinar, we talked about design thinking and living lab essentials. Today, we get even deeper into the heart of innovation as we address moving from prototypes to validation with end users. The expertise guiding us through this series comes from Joelle Mastelich and her team at the Energy Living Lab Association. The presentation part of the webinar will be recorded and stored in CETP's YouTube channel and later in the CETP Impact Library that we are launching this year. In there, you will be able to find all the three parts of the series. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Joelle. Enjoy the webinar. So welcome to the second webinar on validation. And today we will talk about unlocking the power of clean energy innovation with Living Labs. And the steps we are in are the validation steps with the end users. So what we will see today is to try to understand the end users. We will propose as well a structured way of validating with end user. Then we will have an expert interview and an interactive activity. So why do we need to understand the user? If we want to succeed with an innovation, we need to understand the perception of the different stakeholders and not only the buyers. Because if we focus only on the buyers and the company, we can miss other barriers that we block the innovation to go forward. For instance, it can, it can have legal constraints to take into account or management of the innovation. There are different types of stakeholders to take into account. When we work with Living Labs, we are taking four categories that we call the quadruple helix. They are the public authorities, the companies, the citizen and the academics. And what is really interesting is to understand and to cross the different perceptions of the different types of stakeholders. But of course, without understanding the needs, understanding the, the end users, the innovation will not be adopted. So it, it is so important to put the user at the center of the development. So then we would like to focus as well on the socio-technical system. Take a building, for instance, you want to develop a new device uh, to um, control the heating systems in a building. This is always a combination of the technical apparel that we, you will propose and of the human that will use this system. So every system is a socio-technical system. There is a technique, technical dimension and a societal dimension. So to assess the innovation, you can use the technological readiness level, but also the societal readiness level. For an innovation to be adopted by the society, there are different steps to be achieved. So we wanted to compare the technological readiness level and the societal readiness level of the different steps. So in TRL1, we are talking about basic questions, research questions. We are just at the start of this um, development. And in the societal readiness level, we are talking about the problem. What is the why, the problem you want to tackle as an innovator, what you want to solve in the society, or what you want to mitigate, because some problems cannot be solved, but they can only be mitigated. Then we go on TRL2, 
about the concept. So what is the technology that you want to develop uh, for the questions that you have? And in the societal readiness level, you must be capable of proposing a formulation for your problem and identify the different stakeholders that will help to find solutions. In TRL3, uh, we test the critical functions and we do a proof of concept of this technology that we have reflected on. And in the societal readiness level, we test the proposed solutions with relevant stakeholders. So we do a stakeholders value analysis and then we go to the key stakeholders that we have identified with specific tools and we uh, test the solution. So then we go to the TRL4 where we validate in a lab, so not in reality. In the societal readiness level, uh, we would like to validate in a real life environment, in the relevant environment. Testing the technology in the lab is great, but being able to validate the technology, you need to go to for a pilot, and this pilot needs to be in a relevant environment. Take again the same building. If you have in the building only researchers, because it's a research infrastructure, then you cannot validate what is the level of competencies of your user in the building. If they are all researchers trained in energy, they won't see the same problems and they won't see the same value or the, soli so the solutions that you are developing. So it's really um, important to test in a relevant environment. Then in the TRL5, uh, you are validated in the relevant environment and in the SRL5 by the relevant stakeholders. And in the SRL6, you demonstrate your technology in a demonstrator, for instance, and in the SRL6, the solution is demonstrated with relevant stakeholders. You must admit that it, in each stage, it can be different stakeholders that you want to integrate to test and validate different functions, different elements that are creating value. In TRL7, so you are closer to the actual uh, demonstration and, and operation environment. Uh, so you demonstrate your prototype in an operational environment. What does it mean? That means that it interacts with other systems. And in the SRL7, uh, we retest the solution and we refine in the relevant environment with the stakeholders. Potentially, a solution can really uh, work well in an isolated environment, even if it is a real life environment. When you put that in a complex system, in a house, and you see how it interacts with the other systems, maybe you can have troubles as well. So you have to retest in the real life with the relevant stakeholders. In the TRL8, the system is complete and qualified. And in SRL8, uh, you have a plan for the societal, societal adaptation. In the TRL9, this is the last TRL, your system is proven operational in its an environment, final environment. And the SRL9 as well, the solution proven in the relevant environment. So you see that if you are in TRL 7 and you are in SRL 1 or 2, because you have not integrated the relevant stakeholders, you will have to go back to SRL 1 and do your tests. That's really important that the societal readiness level and the technological readiness level go hand in hand in your development in order to assess all the different functions, all the different barriers, and that you are able to nourish your development with quick feedbacks from the different stakeholders. So understanding the end users is part of the validation. You do your technical validation, but you should as well test if the innovation that you are proposing 
will be adopted by the end user. So the first thing, and it relates as well to the design thinking, is the problems, understanding the problems, understanding the needs. We call it empathize. You empathize with the end user to understand what's the real problem. Why are we developing this solution? And begin by one, by why is the most important. So put the stakeholders at the beginning of the development, the SRL1 and the TRL1, in order to really nourish your development with real problems that needs to be mitigated or solved. So what are these different needs? So Maslow has proposed a well-known pyramid about the different needs. So you have first the biological needs and phy physiological needs, and this, when these needs are filled, then you are going for your safety, you are find, finding a safe environment to live, and, and then you go on into despairing to the love and belonging, and esteem, and then self-actualization. As long as each stage is fulfilled, you go to the next stage. And your development, you should always ask yourself, so to what type of needs do I answer? Um, I am answering the need of a safer solution using energy, or am I using the need of um, having an esteem for myself because I am installing PV and like my, in my neighborhood, uh, I get more esteem from my neighbors, or uh, am I self actualizing because I need lots of information in energy and I would like to learn more on this energy transition. So this pyramid can be a start in the needs, in the why that you are working on uh, with your solutions. So understanding the problem is really the first stage. It begins by um, a divergent phase where you explore the different types of problem. There are different tools to do so, such as the problem tree, to be able to explore and open. And then um, you need to close it, to describe it in uh, the requirements. So what are the requirements for the problem that you want to solve? And from these requirements, we call it in requirement engineering, you can develop uh, your solution because you know what is required by the user, so the requirements. So how to analyze the end user? So important, we are talking about empathizing to understand their behaviors, but also social practices. What practices do you want to change? For instance, when we took the example of the buildings, there is a performance gap in the buildings. The buildings are consuming too much, of what they are supposed to consume because of a certain behavior. For instance, letting the windows open. So you need to empathize and understand why are they using, uh, are they opening the windows and letting the windows open? So first you need their trust, to build trust and it takes really time. And then you can observe them or engage them in situ in order really to understand uh, the behaviors, the social practices, and how it influences your technology. And it needs to be in real life. That's why we need living labs. If it's not in real life, and you have researchers that are analyzed and not end users, or if you are studying on students, they don't have the same behaviors, they don't have the same background, they don't have the same knowledge, meaning that you are testing something but not on the right stakeholders with the right environment. So how to create value with your technology with the user? You can use the value proposition Canva. I think that this is a business tool that is really well known. I, will, I would like to explain it somehow differently today. So let's say that you are, are producing new technology for solar panel. This is your product and your service. Uh, and you are creating gains, you are creating value for 
the customers and you are relieving some pains that they have. So this is about techno push. You are pushing your technology to the market, but you don't know what the customer wants. So if you integrate them in TRL9, you will have to pivot and you will have to pay a lot of money to change the technology if it is not exactly what the end user is expecting. So the other way around is about talking about a potential customer, a stakeholder, and understanding what is the job that they have to do if they want to install a solar panel. So they have to reflect on the technology. Do they want thermal or do they want electric? Uh, and then uh, what are the suppliers and what are the level of confidence regarding the suppliers? So what are the financial models and who is providing the financial models? There are lots of jobs to be done by the customers. And the customer can do by its own or uh, with support. So they have pains, for instance, it has a cost and how to finance this technology, uh, different types of uh, pains. There are lots of suppliers who can we trust and so on. So this is about understanding the gains, the pains and the market. Then you have a product market fit. What does it mean? That means that your technology answer a real need from the end user and uh, the other stakeholders are there to support the development because they see, you know, the barriers, you know what drives the technology and you can develop your technology with the different stakeholders. So in order to do this, you have to really understand who is your end user. And there is a tool that we would like to provide at the end uh, to understand the stakeholder. So you can do interviews with 15 stakeholders, for instance, to understand their profiles and determine different profiles that will be using your technology. And that's really often we are talking about segmentation, you are separating uh, your audience into different profiles, into different personas, and you are trying to understand what is the environment uh, in which they are using the technology? What motivates them to do so? What are their frustrations? What are their pains at the moment? So who are this person? And then you have to uh, research on it. You can do ethnography, for instance, you can go and do interviews with them, take pictures or ask them to take pictures so that you better understand who they are, how they use the technology at the moment, what are their practices that is influencing the energy consumption and the energy production. So we have done this in the neighborhood that I have uh, presented at the beginning, uh, doing um, interviews in situ, taking pictures, of the energy consumers and also doing uh, inquiries in order to quantify the different behaviors. What we have done as well, uh, we have done correlation with the load curves in order to understand uh, the different profiles of the personas, but also their energy consumption. So we were able to map and to see correlation between what they consume, how much they consume, when they consume, and their profiles. And we could develop subgroups and try to find correlation between the, the groups of uh, consum consumers and the, the personas. So you can really deep dive into this tool. You can use it really simply, or you can also uh, be able to quantify with uh, consumption the different personas. So how to interact with end users to validate your technology? I have read a book recently that's called Change Your Question, Change Your Life. This is really about interacting with the different stakeholders and asking new questions. Why? Because new questions are generating new knowledge and refinement of the technology, refinement on 
the requirements that you think that you should answer. So, for instance, example of question, how much we, you think about what, the context, which actors, for whom, and the problem to be solved. In my former example, how might we help Joel, you describe the persona, to do what, buy solar panels or choose solar panels in her context. And what is really important is the energy literacy. There is a lot that is done uh, with researchers that have a high literacy. They know much about energy, but your end user don't know nothing about uh, energy. That means that if you are testing and try to validate your technology with researchers in your lab or your students, then it's not the same energy literacy. So you cannot validate your technology with uh, colleagues, uh, researchers, or with uh, your students because they don't have the same literacy. That's really important that you do it in the field, in real life, with real stakeholders and identify the pains and the games. So in this example, I would love to have solar panels on my roof to reduce my CO2 footprint, but I have no engineering background and I don't know who to trust because there are lots of different providers that are calling me at home and I don't know who to trust. And uh, it, it is also an investment. I don't know who will give me the budget in order to invest. So I have barriers my knowledge about energy. I have barrier, financial barriers as well, and I have trust barriers. Who can I trust? So how might we help Joel reducing her CO2 footprint? This is one of the questions that we could ask. And this is not only about Joel, but Joel is a persona, a generalization of a category. And uh, there are different personas with different needs. That means that um, you need to get a consensus about the persona that you choose and what do they need. So I need more motivation. Do I need more information on where to start? Do I need more information on how to finance the technology and so on? So understanding end user is really key. Um, to understand on which barriers you want to work and what are the practice you want to change with your technology. That means to ask a lot of questions from the beginning to the stakeholders. So I give you another example of the work that we have done. Uh, one of my colleagues asked me, but why? are there not so many PV on the roofs? It was like uh, eight or well, 10 years ago. And I said, because it's so complex, we don't know which technology to choose. We don't know where to get the money. Uh, we don't know who to trust. And we have developed together with the installer, uh, with the end consumer and with the cities, this uh, platform, which is a procurement platform where the city is running this process together with the university to group uh, the buying process of uh, solar PV for the citizen of a city. That means that all the process is online and we have also developed algorithm in order to choose from the different providers that will propose an offer the two best offer depending on the criteria that the city has proposed so that uh, the final end user can select one of these offers and be reassured about the technology, be reassured about the price and also is supported by a financial model so that they can invest. So this is a really successful program in the west part of Switzerland where we have developed this with uh, HUSSO, so the University of Applied Science, Western Switzerland. And there are technologies inside, for instance, the new algorithm uh, to be able to select the offer or uh, uh, new technologies to be able to know how much uh, surface do you need to equip 
depending on the consumption of each neighborhood, but it's more about understanding the needs and removing the barriers to adoption. So it would be really simpler if we were to talk about only the end user. But as we mentioned at the beginning, they are not only the end users. We have to take into account also the public authorities that are doing the laws. For instance, in Switzerland at the moment, they are talking about a new law on energy communities. It will change everything for the market. So taking into account uh, the public authorities, the new law, how uh, the law changes, but also the research. So what are the developments that are happening at the moment? Also taking into account the companies, what are the companies that are working in this sector? What are the offers that is already existing? And also uh, the end user, the citizen, the association of the civil society. And we put all these actors together in order to develop the new technology, in order to validate the offer that we would like to do. That means uh, putting around the table the city, uh, the citizen that wants to buy the solar panels, the suppliers of the technology, and also the researchers that are acting as facilitators so that we can co-design the technology together with the actors. So, and how to select, how to engage. It's not possible to engage and to get all the stakeholders because it would be too expensive. So we have a simple tool, which is a matrix to understand the power. So who has the power to influence our development and who has the interest on this? We would like to have people that have interest and the power, these are the players. But with the process that we are putting in place, uh, we are trying to select and empower the people that have an interest, for instance, the citizen, and to engage the context setter, such as the citizen mayors, the, the city mayors. Uh, we try to engage them in the processes. So it would be too expensive to engage and interact with the uh, many stakeholders that don't have any interest nor power that's important to be able to select with whom we want to work to develop the technology and validate our prototypes so how to find new stakeholders so that comes from the project the project needs uh, we can do an ecosystem mapping. I will show you one example uh, to know who are the actors that could be integrated in our development. Uh, you have to develop your network as well. There are lots of conferences and lots of events where you can meet and exchange with the stakeholder. You can also launch open calls for collaboration. When I work with the uh, European Commission in the research center, they have launched open calls for startups so, can, so that the startups are able to use their research infrastructure. So connecting directly the startups with research and being able to be sure that uh, we are uh, at the right step stage of, uh, of development, connecting research and uh, startups. You can also collaborate with living labs. So in the European network of living labs, you have 150 li active living labs all around Europe, uh, and you can have established partnerships. If you don't know how to engage with the user, they know they have these competencies. And in the platform, on the CTP platform, you have also living labs that can help you. And also providing incentives for stakeholders. So what do they gain when they develop with you? For instance, if they develop a platform with you, uh, can they get uh, an expertise uh, to buy new solar panels uh, for the houses? So it's really important to be transparent and open in your communication and manage expectations. When we do um, prototype development and testing with real users in a real condition, that's really important to manage the expectation. If you 
declare that you will that you can do something you, you need to be sure that then you will be able to deliver because in research project you have deliverables but when you are working with real people you you really need to uh, provide what you uh, declared so management of expectation is something really important in this type of uh, processes and of course, there are lots of different methods, participative methods to engage them. Um, but this is influences your working methods, meaning that when we are working in interdisciplinarity and in transdisciplinarity, so there are different disciplines working together, but also you are integrating the end user into your research in transdisciplinary approaches, you are changing the way you are working as well. So be prepared to adapt your methods as well. Um, in Living Labs, you are confronting different audiences. So you are not avoiding conflict, but you need resolution mechanism in order to manage these conflicts so that uh, you can exchange, and that's really important to exchange point of views, but in a cordial manner and where you manage this, this conflict, this opposition of ideas so that you can develop your solution further. And it's important, and we will come to this at the end, to have clear KPIs, so performance indicators. So how do we do all this? How do we combine the societal readiness level and the technological readiness level? I have done my PhD on this, on the Energy Living Lab approach. And we have come up with a process that we are using in all our different projects. This is a combination of the design thinking, so the problem space and solution space, about socio-technical systems. So we are talking about practices. And the first step is to select the practice. What did the practice that you want to change? Then you integrate the stakeholders and you uncover the barriers. And in Living Labs, we are not uh, ideating on our own. We are co-designing, for instance, climate and energy plants with cities. We are co-designing the plants with them. And not one person is reflecting on in an office to know what is the best idea for uh, the project. And then we are going into prototyping, piloting in real life, testing, implementing, and scaling up. And I would say that this part is really important. Uh, because excellence in execution for me is uh, of utmost importance more than the ID because everybody can have a great ID but how you implement it how you put it into real life how it interacts with uh, the audience in real life this is where you have an adoption or not this is where your technology will be developed further or stopped so the first steps are empathizing and defining. That's very really important. And if you know the lean startup uh, to get feed fail fast, meaning if, if you have an hypothesis uh, for your technology, you have to test it quickly, uh, as quickly as possible with your uh, end users in order to adapt and constantly adapt your innovation. And it will inform the uh, different functions that you are developing. So it will change the requirements. When you do requirements engineering, you are doing your description of the functions. It will inform the functions that you have to develop. And then you can test the feasibility, the viability of the project. So it's very important to decrease the costs and use less resources to be in contact with the stakeholder and validate uh, your hypothesis from the beginning. So I am a researcher, so validating, it means quantitative methods. That, that says that uh, 
if you are doing interviews to understand if your hypothesis about the function is right, then you have to quantify it in a way uh, to take the right decisions. So also in terms of stakeholder engagement, if you talk about your technology from the beginning, then they will be engaged they will know about what you do and they would like to be engaged. If you push your technology at the end in TRL9, uh, this is where you will be either rejected or adopted. Uh, but the, the engagement begins in, in the first stages of the TRL and the SRL. So what you can do, you can do expert interviews, you can do analysis of Profiles, as I mentioned before, you can do um, the um, analy analysis and clustering or load curves, and you can compare them uh, with uh, the user profiles. Um, and you can involve the uh, end users into the conceptualization phase. You can do um, workshops, uh, focus groups. You can even uh, observe them and measure uh, when in contact with your technology, how they react. So this map is an example of one of uh, our living labs and project where we try to map from the center, the partnership. So the partnership are the one, for instance, in a consortium that are signing the consortium agreement. So when you have contracts, you have contracts with these partners. Then there is a second round, which are the people that are that you will engage in your project. And there is a third round. This is the one that you try to engage through your different partners. So there are always four types of partners. So the citizen, industry, government and academia. And the one in the center are in the contract, in the partnership. And uh, if you go to the end of the, the bigger round, you will see the people and the type of stakeholder that you would like to engage, but maybe through the different partners of your project. You can see that um, this is provided by the Sweet Lantern. So if you go on the Energy Living Lab website or Sweet Lantern website, you have all the templates so you can use for your own project. We are working in Creative Commons, meaning that we would like to share all the templates that we are developing in our different projects. So take the example of this divan side management. This is an app in order to help the people that have no energy literacy uh, to interact and reduce their consumption. What does it mean? That means that they are no experts. They don't know about energy. This is what energy literacy is about. And you are providing this technology. So what does it mean? It means that you have data and you can measure data in real life to see how they use this technology. But not only you can also do interviews, to be able to understand what they like, what they don't like. Is it answering a need? How they use it? You can also observe them in using the technology. So, and in the project, you have to map and you can map the different types of partners that you want to engage. So for instance, the consortium, so the researcher that are signing the contract with you. Then you have the authorities, the public authorities in orange. And then you have uh, the national energy advisor, the household, the citizen. These are the people that we want to engage. And in green, you have uh, the companies and the private sector that you will uh, engage and all these people they will give you another view they will give you their view on the development and what is really interesting if you can do focus group for instance not only with the end user but also with this other type of actors so that they can exchange and create a consensus at the end on your technology so that you don't have to pivot later on when all these actors will be confronted to your technology at the end of the pipe. So the second step is about ideation. 
So there are plenty of methods to ideate and conceptualize. You can collaborate with other R&D organizations. You can organize participative workshops. There has been a lot of hackathons in the past years. Uh, you can also integrate your students into the development to have new insights. And we are at the TRL3 or SRL3 uh, when doing this and ideating. Can give you examples from uh, the climate on uh, Zurich on the future of mobility and also participative uh, workshops that we organize in the National Open Innovation Camp, grouping all the different types of stakeholders, presenting technologies and uh, putting into the light uh, different innovation teams that have developed uh, new technologies. Then the third step is about piloting and testing the technology. It means uh, in real life. So this is an example of the Open Lab project, which is a European project that we are conducting at the moment in three cities. And this one is uh, proposed in, in Tartu. And they are testing uh, solar panels uh, on all the buildings. And this is about refurbishment of neighborhoods so that they uh, can uh, increase their energy efficiency uh, and, and become positive energy neighborhoods. So it's really about testing in real life uh, the technology, co-designing the prototypes uh, and uh, so showcasing solutions as well, because sometimes the people don't know the technology. So even if you are showcasing, you are giving ideas uh, so that you can increase the level of interest around your technology and co-design with them, reflect on the functionalities and do experimentation and get data to validate because validating is about data, data collection so that you can validate your technology and adapt it further. And then there is the implementation scale. Though. So this, this is the example of the Nest a Living Lab. Um, they have a really interesting uh, features where you can, in a building, develop modules in real life. So they, these are used uh, by researchers, not uh, by a citizen, but they can test the systems and the integration of the different elements into a real system uh, in order to test the technology further. And the idea then is to be able to take this technology in real life, in real buildings, but this is just before real life. This is in real life, but with uh, researchers that are using uh, the space. So we are talking about pre-living lab settings. Uh, a living lab setting for me is in real life, so in a real building that is not a research infrastructure. If we are in a research infrastructure where you can control everything and where you have inhabitants that are researchers, we call it pre-living lab settings. It's just before going real life uh, with the, the technology. And you can also showcase the technology, uh, get more funding for the technology, uh, and engage to build trust so that the technology can be then adapted in real life. So these demonstration sites are really interesting for this. You can analyze the performance and you can analyze the interaction of the system with the end user. So why does implementation matter? You go from the theoretical concept, so from SRL1, TRL1, to the prototypes and to test in the real world. And it, is, it provides a test bed for refining your innovation and also for adoption and diffusion of innovation. Because as I mentioned before with the Joint Research Center, when you develop a technology and nobody can see it and it is not in real life, uh, that's more difficult then to have an adoption 
and to see how it integrates in a real system. So that's really important to implement the technology the right way so that you're increasing the chances of having a, an, an adoption and a societal improvement. You are generating societal value out of it. So I would say excellence in execution is key. The idea is great and everybody can have great ideas, but the real um, value that is created is, is in execution and how we can execute better uh, the, in real life the different technologies that are developed. So talking about scaling out and scaling up, Mancini is proposing uh, a definition about the scale out and he proposed that the scale out is expanding the size and the scope of your initiative uh, to grow the initiative. For instance, uh, having from one building to three buildings or then to a neighborhood. And scaling up is about replicating and disseminating the technology across different locations. In projects, that's really often that we have follower cities that are replicating in different conditions and circumstances because the technology needs to adapt to specific context and the wider and the varied the context is, uh, the, the better the replication will be so that we can test in different, under different conditions the technologies. So, the key performance indicators are important in the technical part, but also in the social part. And you can measure the engagement and the empowerment of the stakeholders. So how many people you have contacted? Uh, what is the percentage of uh, the members that are highly engaged? number of interaction, how many events, how many um, yeah, people participating in your different activity. It fosters a sense of ownership. And uh, also what we use in our living lab are uh, key indicators, not only on the number of people participating, but on the minutes where we have a conversation one too many, so one person is presenting and 100 people are listening, and a ratio of how much activity we have with the audience, so participative activities. And we try in all our events in Living Labs to have one part that is one too many, translating, so translating knowledge, uh, being able to transfer, but also participative uh, activities in order to uh, talk with the participant, to exchange, uh, so that we can also collect information and gain new knowledge from the participants. So now we will go into uh, an interview from Tony Caro. Tony Caro is senior researcher in a living lab that exists for already a long time, I2CAT, in Barcelona. You may know that they have organized in Barcelona the last Open Living Lab Days. And uh, we had the pleasure to e exchange with her during this event on transformative go governance for the future. I am working at the moment with the I2CAT Foundation that is a living lab since 2006 itself as an organization and the unit I'm working with is the Digital Technology Society unit that is 
the different different units within uh, the organization because it's more focused on how we design the new uh, generation of living labs with a new approach to these transitions in a more encompass encompassing way. We are seeing that the way we are going is not working. So more and more we bring the, um, the helix that has been forgotten in, in the last 20 years, the, the citizens, the social innovators, the uh, uh, social organizations into um, building together new dynamics, new social dynamics. We are designing these new social um, and governance structures that help us to have a, a more holistic approach on the needs, on the interests of the people, on how we can uh, develop things that are of interest for all of us as humanities, as humanity to develop in another way. Because so that's um, what we are trying to do, and uh, we use technology. We also use different sciences uh, like techno-anthropology, social science, social innovation. Uh, and and the, we put all these things together, design thinking, etc., so that we, we, we make this um, happening. From the very beginning, I mean, uh, I have been uh, working in many, many projects that I have seen uh, people thinking on the impact at the very end. And then there was a problem for people to think that this um, idea was theirs or uh, they, they have any attached to the idea or to the result. So one thing that we have realized is that when we have the ideation in a co-creative manner, it takes longer because you need uh, to negotiate more with, uh, with the people that are in the table. First, you need to have a common language common understanding of what are the needs of the different uh, actors, but then uh, people own the, the, the project. And then when they own the project, they are more committed, they are more um, um, really think that the, what they are doing has a meaning for them, uh, it is uh, more relevant, and they see that they can uptake the results in a better manner because they have been part of the, of the process. So it's not at the end I ask you, is you have been part of this and we can refine the idea all together when we are in the, in the process.